what's up students today we're going to talk about rotational dynamics and pretty much how newton's second law f equals ma is going to apply to objects that are traveling around in a circle or spinning to do so first we need like a basic understanding of torque so i'm just going to go back real fast i'm going to review torque pretty quickly so torque has a symbol of t a unit of newton meters and it is the ability to cause angular acceleration or to get things to speed up in a circle one way or slow down the other way. The formula that we saw for torque is going to be equal to a perpendicular force to some sort of lever arm. And if that force is not perpendicular, we must take the sine of that force. So it became F sine theta R perpendicular. Okay, so this formula is given on your reference table for the AP exam. If you need more detail about how to use that formula, you can check out the playlist that I'll put at the end of the card for all the other torque videos. And R was equal to the moment arm, or we also called it the lever arm. And there was a relationship between R and torque that we need to understand. As the lever arm went up, so did the torque force. That also went up. So those were going to be related. And the other last thing that we need to know is that when something is spinning in a clockwise direction, we are going to call that torque negative. And when something spins in a counterclockwise fashion, we call that torque force positive. So torque is a vector and is going to have some sort of direction. So now let's use that torque force in a dynamic fashion to show how things are forced to speed up or slow down. And we'll remember Newton's second law is equal to F net MA. Now we can use this formula to derive Newton's second law in terms of rotation. So pretty much in a rotational form. And we're going to do so by looking at this torque equals RF. So now I can look for commonality between the two so that I can come up with one expression. Well, F equals MA. So I can now rewrite this as R. M A. So torque equals R times the mass of that object times acceleration. But this here is still linear. So we have to look at the relationship of how I can make that a linear and relate that to rotation. So we do so by multiplying R times alpha. So now substituting that in, I can see that torque is now going to be equal to R M right here and the substitution R alpha. Clean that up a little bit. I just get M r squared alpha. So in a sense, this is the rotation form of m, and this is the rotation form of a. So now we see that f, which torque is a, a force that causes an object to want to spin, m a. But now this m r squared, it has a name and also a variable. We call this the moment of inertia, and it has a variable capital I. Now the reason we can't leave it mr squared is because every object is going to have its own moment of inertia, just like every object has its own mass. So I'm going to rewrite that torque formula now in a more general fashion. Torque is equal to the moment of inertia times A, where this is acting as the resistance to want to change, just like mass does. Remember, Newton's first law is an object in motion remains in motion until stopped by an outside force. Same holds true here. A mass has a resistance to want to change, whether it's moving or not. An object also has a resistance to want to spin, whether it's moving or not. And that's what I is. So I is dependent on the object. But if I have a center of mass here, and there's an object out here that's spinning in a circle, for one mass, I need to remember that I is equal to m r squared. This is something that you should definitely memorize, where this r is the distance from the center of mass. For multiple particles that are spinning, the moment of inertia total is just going to be equal to the sum of all the m r squareds, all of the particles. And we're going to look at an example of that. Say this was the center of mass, and this was a particle out here, and it had a mass of 7 kilograms. And we'll say it was spinning in a counterclockwise fashion. I could then say that the moment of inertia for this one object is equal to m r squared. So if I knew this was, say, 2 meters out here, I will now say that the moment of inertia of this particular object spinning is going to be 7 times 2 squared. 28 kilogram meters squared. But now say this was the center of mass and I had an object out here, 
that was, say, two kilograms, and it was three meters out here. And then I had another object that's out here three meters, and that had a mass of four kilograms. If I want to find I total now, I take the MR squared of the two kilogram object plus the MR squared of the four kilogram object. That will be how I find the moment of inertia for this particular system. And this, this with the center of mass being right here, it doesn't matter where the center of mass is and where that particle is in relation to that as far as what side. For example, if say I had, this was particle A and this was particle B and this was particle C and it was spinning around in a counterclockwise and this is the center of mass and these were each say one meter intervals. I would then find I total by saying m r squared plus m r squared plus m r squared for each one of these. So it would be the mass of A times one squared plus the mass of B times two squared. Now why is it two? Well, because B is two meters from the center of mass, plus the mass of C times three squared. Why? Because C is three meters from the center of mass. So this is how you would find I total and how you're going to do that for single particles given in a plane. Now, with the exception of MR squared, other common I's will be given. So for example, a solid disk, you'll see this solid disk. That is equal to one half m r squared. What we just saw for a single particle, which could also be a hoop, and that's when all of the mass is located on the outer surface of that object spinning. That, in fact, is m r squared as well. Uh, another common one is, say, a, a sphere, a solid sphere. That's equal to two fifths m r squared. So I'm going to give you all of these i's if you cannot solve for it. Oftentimes you can solve. Right, because I can solve for this if I know torque equals IA. If I can solve for the acceleration and I can solve for the torque, I can find the moment of inertia. I don't need to give it to you. But other ones, you will be given. But I highly recommend memorize MR squared for a single particle, some R from the center of mass. Let's take a look at some examples now of how we can use this formula. All right, so in this example, I have a frictionless pulley. Okay, it has a diameter of 20 centimeters, a mass of 4 kilograms, and there's two forces that are acting tangent to this pulley. One is a force of 50 newtons, and the other one is the force of 30 newtons. And I want to know what is the angular acceleration of the disk, where I equals 1 half mr squared. Now, pause the video, see if you can solve for the angular acceleration of this disk. Now, our first default might be to go towards kinematics. We might say, oh, I know alpha is equal to a change in omega over t, but I don't know initial and final speeds. And the same would hold true with all of the kinematics formulas. So what I need to do is I need to now look at using formulas that don't involve initial and final speeds. And that's where we see the net torque is equal to I alpha. So A equals net torque over the moment of inertia. This is super similar to A equals F net over M. So you've done this before earlier in the year. We're just changing out the variables. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find the F net acting on this disk. So let's do that. So the net torque is just going to be the sum of the torques, right? So we have to look, we're going to have torque one and we are going to have torque two. Torque one is going to be equal to R F perpendicular of one. And this is going to be R F two. Well, if this has a diameter of 20 centimeters. That means the R is going to be 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters. So 0.1 times 30, that's F one, which guys remember is perpendicular to the moment arm. So this is the moment arm R. This is perpendicular to it. So I don't need any signs here. That is going to be equal to three Newton meters and this 30 Newton force is going to make this go counterclockwise. So we're going to give it a positive value. Where here we have 0.1 times 50 Newtons. That's F2. Now we say that's equal to 5 Newton meters. But this force is going to make the object spin clockwise. Therefore, it is going to get a negative sign. That's really important. So now we see torque net is going to be equal to 3 
minus 5, which is going to be equal to minus 2 newton meters. And what this means is that the forces, these two forces are going to cause a net torque, which is going to make this object spin clockwise. So now I can see alpha equals the net torque over I, which is going to be equal to minus 2 newton meters divided by, this is a solid disk with a given I of 1 half 4 kilograms times 0.1 meters squared, mr squared. So therefore we see that the alpha is equal to minus 100 radians per second squared. Remember, this minus just means clockwise. So if I had if I had also asked for the direction of the angular acceleration, you'd have to use the right hand rule. So you'd wrap your fingers with your right hand clockwise, and we would say that the acceleration is into the page. Now there's one more example I want to do that's a little bit more complicated, and that's when we don't have forces that are making something spin, but another mass itself. If we recall back to earlier in the year when I had a pulley and there was like a mass up here and there was a tension force here and I would say that this was equal to F equals 15 newtons. And then I asked you to compare it to a same exact box with the same exact pulley but now I said that there was a mass equal to 1.5 kilograms. Now we remember that these forces on this box were equal but the accelerations were different. And that was because A equals F net over M. So as M went up, there's no second M here. As M went up, the accelerations went down. We're going to see that the same holds true for I. As I increase the moment of inertia of a system, the acceleration of that system is also going to go down. And that's the example I want to look at right now. So this is the problem right here. And before you pause the video and try and work it out, wait for the hint that I want to give you. What is the acceleration of the bucket and the angular acceleration of this pulley if I have a pulley with a mass of 3 kilograms and a moment of inertia of 0.6 kilogram meters squared? This bucket is hanging, which is going to apply a tension force, and that tension force is going to make this pulley rotate in this fashion. Now remember, I want to know the acceleration of the bucket and then the angular acceleration of the pulley, but here's the tip or the hint. The bucket is moving in a linear fashion where the pulley is moving angularly. So just like in kinematics, regular kinematics, where we looked at X and Y separately, we have to make sure that we are looking at the linear and the angular separately as well. So when you're trying to solve this problem or starting to solve it, look at the bucket and the pulley as separate objects and then see if you can find some commonality between the two. Pause the video. Try and work this out right now. Okay, so right now on the bucket, we have two forces acting on the bucket. We have Fg, and we have the force of tension. So if we look at the F net equals Ma, as we did in the beginning of the year, we see that Fg, I'll call that direction positive, down is going to be positive, minus Ft equals Ma. And just to keep my positive and negatives, I know that this way, counterclockwise, is positive. That's why I decided in this example to call Fg down positive. I can start to plug some stuff in. 15 newtons minus the force of tension equals 1.5 kilograms times A. Now I know that right here on the outside, these particles are going to accelerate at the same rate as the bucket accelerates. So I can now say, all right, if I know this A, I know that is equal to R alpha. So this right here, this equation, that's going to be the commonality between the two, which is going to allow me to look at the linear acceleration and the angular in the same way. Because right now I have two unknowns, I have this and this, I'm going to see if I can look now at the pulley and see if we can find one of these two so that I can combine the two. Well, when I look at the pulley, I say the same thing, that torque net is going to be equal to I alpha. Well, the tension in the string is the only thing causing this torque. So I can say that Ft times R equals I alpha. So Ft times 0.2 meters, that's the R given right here, equals 0.6 kilogram meters squared given times alpha. So Ft is now equal to 3 kilogram meters times alpha. 
And even though I'm looking at the angular acceleration, this FT here is still the same as this FT. So now let me come over here and put that in here, and then we'll see if I can change some more variables around. So now I'm gonna have 15 Newtons minus, now I'm gonna sub in three kilogram meters alpha. That's gonna be equal to 1.5 A. And to clean that up without units, I'll just write 15 minus three alpha equals 1.5 A. And look at this. Now we see we have two accelerations, one of the linear and one of the angular. So let's look at this equation right here and say, well, let's get rid of this and plug in here because I know R. So that will limit my amount of unknowns. So 15 minus 3 alpha equals 1.5 times what's R? 0.2 meters times alpha. I can now solve for alpha the acceleration of the pulley as 4.5 radians per second squared. This allows me to do some wonderful things now. I can now look at A equals R alpha and go back to that and say 0.2 meters times 4.5 rads per second squared is now going to give me the acceleration of the bucket. A is equal to 0.91 meters per second squared. And if I wanted to be crazy, I could pull this down here. If I asked you for the tension of the string, FT is equal to three kilogram meters times 4.5 rads per second squared. I could also find the tension of the rope. Okay, so this is how we would use torque equals the moment of inertia times A. And we'd also use it with this linear relationship of an object that's moving linearly. I hope this video helped, guys. If you have any questions about it, just leave them down in the comments below. As always, give the video a thumbs up if it did help. That will help promote the video to other people. Hope you have an awesome, awesome day.